Hello, and welcome to Type System Game Engines with me, Josh Goldberg. We're going to talk about some stuff today that's on the internet, on my website, joshuakgoldberg.com. Here's a photo of a cat who I sometimes code with. He's pretty cute, and I thought you'd appreciate him. Our agenda today is pretty simple. We're going to explore the type system. First, we're going to establish a shared understanding and some terminology for what the TypeScript type system is, how it works, and what it does. We're then going to introduce some logical type system constructs, ways for us to build up little pieces of flow and logic in our types. And then we're going to keep expanding on that flow until our heads hurt, our brains explode, and we run out of time. It's going to be great. The end result of that agenda is going to be a type, a tic-tac-toe type that takes in a string and returns the victor, if anyone, of the results of calling all those moves on a tic-tac-toe board. It's going to be great. I like to think that this is more than just a trivial pursuit. It's a way for us to really gain an understanding of how to use TypeScript to its fullest. To start off, what's a type system? What does TypeScript do? Who are we and what are we doing here? Type system, at its very core, is an understanding of the logical flow of the types in your code. If you ever watched Stranger Things or played Dungeons and Dragons, there's the concept of the upside down, which is this dark husk of the real world. If you haven't, that's okay. Instagram is another good analogy here. It's this weird, sad, reflective shell of reality. Just a quick piece of snippet code. Uh, trimmed length is a variable and is set to a function that takes in a text parameter of type string or undefined. The one transform that TypeScript does, everyone is familiar with here, is that it compiles into regular JavaScript. It removes the text string or undefined type annotation. By the way, if you haven't yet played with the um, optional chaining question mark dot syntax, highly recommend, great piece of new JavaScript feature that is supported by TypeScript. But the stuff we're really interested in right now is the type system, the upside down, the dark reflection of that. The type system looks at your code and just figures out what are they? What's their reflection? So hold your pinkies way high up and get a grip because we're going to get real fancy here and we're going to have a good time and it's going to be fun. The first thing we're going to look at are conditional generics, which are a building block way to add logic to the type system. Let's take a look at, as promised, some real production-ish code, the trimmed length variable. So this function takes in string or undefined and returns number or undefined in theory. But in practice, we know that if we pass it a string, it definitely is going to return a number. We can figure that out by looking at the code. If text is undefined or void, then, pardon me, or null, then we return text. But if it's a string or something that's not undefined or null, then we keep going and call trim.length. So what we need is a way to tell TypeScript, I know you think it's one thing, but we have a much better, more precise, specific type to indicate that it is. We can do that with this generic type number of defined. So let's walk through this in order. The trend length variable is now equal to a generic function that takes in a T type. That T type is something like a string or undefined and is the type of text, but it could be more specific. It could be just string or just undefined. We then pass that T to a number if defined generic, which is kind of the meat of this part. Given an existing type T, so the string or undefined that we're taking in earlier, if that t can be undefined, so if that t extends undefined, then the new resultant type is itself number or undefined. If t could not be undefined, so it does not extend undefined, then the new type is number. Thus, we have a conditional type or a ternary statement in the type system, and that's pretty great. We can finally tell TypeScript, shut up, I know what I'm doing. You might think text.trim.length is number or undefined, but I know if it's a string that's being given in, and it's actually specifically a number. So looking at a couple of examples, if we pass Josh the string to trimmed length, then t is a string, and the string does not extend undefined, so the result is number, the last statement in the type. If we pass in something that TypeScript infers can be a string or undefined, then t is string or undefined, which can extend undefined, which means we go to the first statement in the conditional, the number or undefined result. So yay, hooray, good, jolly. We have declared logic in the type system. We do have a slight bug in it though that we should probably fix. Um, if t is specifically undefined, which is gonna result in number undefined, we probably would instead want it to resolve to, well, 
just undefined, because we know if we pass an undefined, we get undefined. So we'll need a slightly more complex conditional type. We'll need one that checks if t is undefined and t extends string, so it's string or undefined, then the result is number or undefined. But if t is undefined and not a string, it's just undefined. OK, and what we really want to talk about is games. And we don't have quite enough information or, or tools in our toolkit to talk about tic-tac-toe yet. But we can talk about rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors is a pretty simple game. We can represent it in this rock matchup type for a player who has a rock. If the opponent is a rock, then the result of the game is a draw. If the opponent has paper, then the result of the game is a loss. We can even get a little more fancy, where if the player is a rock and the opponent is a rock, then it's a draw, and so on and so forth. So this is good. Next up, now that we can declare these very basic types, let's look at other types within those types, called type members. Take the get function from lodash, which takes in a container and some form of a key, and returns the member of the container under that key. How would you type this in TypeScript? Well, to start, key is probably something like a string or number. And using the previous generics, we can make some sort of T for the container. But we really want to be able to say that the key is specifically a key of the container's T, where if the container has a finite known set of properties, key has to be one of them. Well, you know, fortunately for us, TypeScript's great, and it has a key of operator, which does exactly that. Key of is a type system operator that takes in a type and returns all the members of that type, all the keys of them. So great. Now we can do that for our rock, paper, scissors matchup, where matchups is a big type object, rock, paper, and scissors are members. And if we want to figure out the result of the game, we pass the player and the opponent into this rock, paper, scissors type. Each of player and opponent extend the key of matchups, meaning in this position, extend says they are restricted to something. And then the result is, if the opponent is one of the matchups of the player, then we give that matchup. If not, it must be the same thing because process of elimination, and we get a draw. Hooray. For example, if we pass paper and scissors into the type, uh, the player is paper, the opponent is scissors, the result is matchups of paper of scissors, which is a loss. Let's move on. Tuple types, or fixed size arrays. React recently started to help popularize the pattern of returning a fixed size array from a function. Let's say the split errors one is a good example. So we know that inputs is a type array of things that are either error or t for some t generic. Errors is an error array. Successes is a t array. But what about the return type of this function? That return type needs a specific array type. It can't just be a general array of error or t. In TypeScript, we can declare that there is a fixed type, a fixed tuple type for an array, where we know the first member of it is specifically an error array, for example, and the second one is specifically, in this case, a t array, which lets us then declare our board, tic-tac-toe, which is an array of arrays. If we declare that every cell on the board is either a blank string for not placed an x or an o, and then we make a list of lists or an array of arrays, then we can describe our tic-tac-toe board in the type system. It's just a list of lists. Cool. Even better, we can describe victory conditions on those boards. So we, the way we might describe a victory condition is that if a player and a board exist such that the board is one of the possible winning boards for the player, or the board extends from those, then there is a victory for the player, otherwise false. We define the, the winning board for a player as one of the three possibilities for winning tic-tac-toe, which are you have three in a row diagonally, three in a row horizontally, or three in a row vertically. So if the winning board is either diagonal, horizontal, or vertical, then the diagonal one would be defined as this, where diagonally down, you have the three players in a row, and anything else, we don't care. It can be any, it could be blank, XO, who cares? Or it's the three players going up, again, with anything in the other cells. Similarly, for the horizontal case, if the player has all of any row, and who cares what the rest is, then they've won the board. Good for them. Yay. For vertical, pretty similar. It's if they have the columns. So taking a couple examples, if we have the starting board, which is all blanks, and we check for a victory of the x player, it's not going to satisfy any of these three, diagonal, horizontal, or vertical, so it'll be false. But 
If we take a board that has O going down the diagonal, that satisfies one of them. It's the second case of the diagonal victory. So that's true. We win, yay. We can even take it a little bit one step further by saying that if we want to check for a board and see if it has a victor or who the winner is, we can first say if there is a victory for X, the winner is X. If there's a victory for O, the winner is O. Otherwise, it's no one. So blank string. So if we take the starting board and we check who is the winner for it, we get blank because neither X nor O win on the starting board. But if we look at winner now for this one with the O diagonal down, O wins. So then it extends O. Hooray. Let's get more advanced. Let's talk about mapped types. We have boards and we can check whether they're a victory, but we don't have any way from going one board to another. So let's add that in. For a practical example, take a look at another Lodash function that's popular, this pick one. We know that the container is some generic type T, and we know that keys is a list of things on that container because we're copying every member from the container into this new picked type under the key. So we can start off typing it like this with the container as a T generic and keys as an array of key of T. But the picked type is kind of difficult. We need a way of saying that given this T and the keys, we have a subset of the original T. There's this picked type we can create. Going through this line by line, showing off some new syntax. Let's create a new type based off of two existing types. We have a container and then some keys on the container type. We're going to create a new object, and here's the mapping. We say for each key in the requested keys, there is a member on the new picked type, and its value is the original container's value under that key. So we're mapping in the sense of array mapping from one type to another. In this case, we're taking a subsection, this specific keys from the container type, and putting it into this new picked type, kind of like what the function was doing at runtime. So that's great. That means that we can define our pick function. It has a container and a generic for its types, and it knows that the return type is picked as, because we know better than TypeScript in this case, specifically the picked types from the container. In fact, this pick type is so useful that it's built into TypeScript. Hooray! There are actually quite a few built in in TypeScript, which are pretty darn useful, a dozen or more of them. And if you want to find any of them, type in one of their names, such as picked, and then select go to definition in an editor such as VS Code. You'll get this libdts file, which has a whole bunch of built-in ones. It's pretty sweet. They're all available, all for you. I'd highly recommend looking through these after this talk or even now, because they show off some really good uses of the type system, some very basic things that you might end up enjoying using in your code. Useful. Using these math types, we can then make our boards fancy. Instead of using a tuple of tuples, which was a little bit more code, sort of, we can now declare the board using rows and columns, where we map from 0, 1, and 2 as the members of the board to 0, 1, and 2 as the members of those members, saying that everything in there is a cell. So this is kind of like what we were doing before with the tuple of tuples, but we're using it in this fancy map syntax, so we should feel good and cool about ourselves. Yay. I'll also note that uh, because this is not a tuple type or not an array type, um, TypeScript might not uh, mind so much later on when it forgets that types we give it are originally arrays. We're kind of bending what TypeScript is supposed to do in the type system, so it makes sense that sometimes it's a little less high fidelity, such as life. Anyway, we can use these map types to place moves on the board, which is how we're really going to get funky with the, the board logic where before we were just declaring it and checking things on it, but now we're going to be modifying our boards. We might take a starting board and a move description, which is a cell, a row, and a column, and then we put the new cell or new piece onto the board. Cool. So how do we do that? How do we copy everything but one piece from an initial board to a result? Well, map types. Let's go over the syntax a little bit, line by line, because it's still pretty new, maybe. Replacing board takes in four type inputs. It takes in a board, which is the board to work on of type tic-tac-toe board. It takes in a replacement to put on the board, also known as a piece. It takes in the row for that piece or replacement, and it takes in a column, and it's gonna create a new type. That new output object type 
for each member under 0, 1, and 2, for each member under its 0, 1, and 2, so copying everything over from the original, we check, is this row and column combination the one that we want to replace at? If so, then we use the new piece. Otherwise, we use the old piece. Mapping. In a way, this is kind of like using a for loop, a double nested for loop, to loop over the original array and copy it over into a new one, except we're using the type system, and it's very declarative and logic and fancy. Cool. So taking an example, uh, if we replace in board with the starting board, x at position 0, 1, we see that at row 0 with this fancy object type, position 1, we get an x. Hooray! Good for us. So this is us leveling up. We're now creating interactive experiences, with dynamic things. We're taking boards and we're putting stuff on them. Let's move on. The next stuff is inferred types or logical type extraction. Now that we can take a look at our types and deeply access members of them, we want to be able to infer based off of those members for some really advanced logic. Suppose you wanted to write a type in your regular code that takes in another type, which is a type, some function, and figures out what the first parameter of that input type is. For example, if the input type it takes in a string and returns void, your new thing would be a string. Or if it takes a number or a string and returns void, your new thing would be number or string. How would you do that in the type system? We don't really have a way yet, but we can add this infer keyword to our conditional types to reach in and grab that parameter and then use it. In this type, we start off with, like before, a first parameter of, of generic type that takes in a t. We then say, if it extends a function type where we don't care about the return, that could be anything, but the first parameter is any type where we're now calling it, inferring it, or extracting it as first param. If this extend is valid, then we return that first param. Great. Otherwise, we return never, which is the this failed, this couldn't be reached, ignore me, never mind type. Cool. So this first param of works. We take in a type, and if it can have a first param from a function, we return that first param. This actually is pretty similar to a couple more built-ins in TypeScript. A return type takes in the function type and infers its return, or R. Parameters infers the array type for args. These are pretty cool. So now let's use them to do some fun stuff. Given a board, I want to be able to apply an array of moves or a list of moves, but it's kind of complex, so I want to go over the functional or logic-based approach to it first. Now you might know that in functional programming, you can't modify values after they're created. So they're, they're immutable. So if we're going to think the way the type system does, which is in this functional manner, we need to be able to create a function that applies an array of moves without modifying a variable, meaning it has to be kind of recursive. So just looking at this function line by line, given a board and a list of moves, the recursive way would be two cases are possible. One is the moves are empty, and the other is that we have more moves to apply. If the moves are empty, we return the board itself. We're done. Hooray. Good for us. If there are moves that we can apply, we first apply the move on the board to make a new board. We then get the remaining moves, so moves.slice of one, the rest of the array, and we recurse with that new or next board and the remaining moves. So this is the recursive type. It works, and it doesn't modify any variables after creation. Good for it. The type system equivalent looks funky, but behaves in a pretty similar way. First, we say if moves is the empty array, so is the moves list empty? If so, we return the board itself for our array apply moves type. Otherwise, we know that we're going to have to recurse. So, in the other case, for moves extends empty array, the it does not, we first make an updated board using the first move which is the replace in board type we've already made with board and the three members of the first move in the array. And then, and this is where the inferred type comes in, we have to drop the rest, the first of the moves and take on the rest. So array.slice one. The way they do that in this code snippet is with this drop first type that checks, can the T type extend from an array that contains anything for the first member and an inferred amount for the rest? If we can infer the rest after the first member, we give it back as you. So drop first is saying we have an array with a first and a bunch of other stuff, and we want the other stuff. 
Otherwise, it's an empty array. So by using this inferred type, we can simulate slicing off part of an array in the type system and then passing it to the recursive call for apply moves. Awesome. So just as a quick example, we might apply two moves in x at 01 and o at 22. And then we can see if you're following along at home, then this uh, resultant type does have an x and an o at the expected places. Great in the comments that's visualized. Cool. So now we're applying move tuples. We've advanced. In fact, we're so advanced that we're applying type recursion, which is so new that this might not have worked for you because you're not yet on TypeScript 4.1, which is the TypeScript version that started allowing this type of very deep recursion. It's pretty sweet stuff. I'm, I'm very impressed with the TypeScript team. Anyway, one last feature that we're going to go over today, it's the most complex and ridiculous, and I think the silliest, but also the coolest for now, string template literal types in the type system. We're doing string parsing in the type system, which itself is kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but it's super useful. Let's look at this interpolate function. It's kind of like a mustache template, but you might have seen this in other localization or templating languages elsewhere. It takes in a template, a key, and a value, all of which are type string at their most basic, and it replaces the key in the template with the value if the key is surrounded by a couple of curly brackets. Now, if the key exists, like in the first or left example, hi, Josh, it's replaced. But if the key doesn't exist, it would be kind of nice to have a type system error to let us know that our nope template passed interpolate doesn't match the name string. That'd be cool. Fortunately, the type system has a thing for that now. We can check if the template string actually matches a particular format, a bunch of stuff in order for the string in the type system. In the conditional type, we can say the key for a template, which uh, might extend a type, is as follows. If the template extends this specific format, where there's any prefix, a key inside the curly brackets, and any suffix, then we extract out or infer the key. Otherwise, no, it doesn't work. It's never. So what we're saying here is that we have a template type, and then we have a key that must be the inferred key from that template type. So in the nope example, we infer the key to be no, because the prefix is a dash, the key is inside the curly brackets is nope, and the suffix is a dash, which means the type system would yell at us that no, name is not a signable parameter of type nope. That, that's pretty awesome. So thank you, TypeScript type system. So our last challenge, the thing that we promised we we're originally going to build is as such. We're going to take this tic-tac-toe type which takes a string and figures out the winner, and we're gonna implement it. Now, the way we're gonna do that is, we're gonna first convert the raw moves description into a list of moves, so parsing the string using the template literal types. And then we're gonna do a bunch of stuff we already know how. We're gonna pass that list of moves to the apply moves type that we just wrote, and then we're gonna pass that result, the resultant board, into the winner type to see who the winner is. So the algorithm for that might look a little something like this, where we have tic-tac-toe, First, we're going to parse the raw moves. We're then going to pass them along with a starting board to apply moves. And then we're going to figure out the winner of that all. Sounds easy enough. It's going to be fun. So the real challenge here is parsing the strings, taking in these new lines separated strings and turning them into moves. Well, the algorithm is two steps, so maybe we can tackle it now. First, we actually do split on end lines, and we'll write a utility type for that. Once we have those end lines split up, we'll then pass them to this other type we have to write, this collect parsed raw moves, which takes in the split types, an array to collect the parsed raw moves into, and then a starting piece, so let's say x, to go first to scan for in those types, in those moves. Cool. Um, I actually lied a little bit. We're not really going to have to write the split type because thank you, Anders. This was one of the types listed in the PR to TypeScript that added string template literals. So I just simplified it a little bit for this presentation and copy and pasted it. The split type takes in text and a string, and it checks three cases. If the text is an empty string, there's nothing left, we have an empty array. If the text extends the template, any prefix, the split string, and then any suffix, that means we've, sat, we've found a piece of the string to split on, which means the result is the array of the prefix and then the recursive call to the rest of the string, splitting on the suffix in the splitter. 
Otherwise, we have not found any more splitters. The text is done. We turn back an array with just the text. So if the string is blank and the splitter is A, as in the first example, then we hit the first case, which is the empty array. If the string does have a few instances of the splitter, such as in the second example, here we have first the prefix is inferred to be ABC, then DEF, then GHI. Part two is going to be taking these parsed new lines, separated strings, and turning them into those real move descriptions, rod or real. That's a little more complex. So first I'm going to define a few utility types to, to make it a little simpler. The first one is a pretty basic conditional. It says if a turn is x, it's, the new type is o, otherwise it's x. So we're switching which turn. This is going to be used when we swap which turn we're parsing because it swaps between x and o each time. The second one is an int to string. You may note that we're taking in string descriptions of the moves, but we need to parse them into numbers. So this takes 0, 1, or 2 in string form and parses it into 0, 1, or 2 in number form. Lastly, for these helpers, we have a parse raw move helper, which takes in a turn and the raw row and column, and then turns those raw rows and columns into the number equivalents. So this is going to take a line, which we'll see gets parsed from a raw string, and turns it into the turn number number equivalent. OK, so this is the type. This is what we've been building to. This is all the stuff we've been using. It's got recursive types, template literal parsing, tuples, maps, all, all sorts of good stuff. So first, we have the type itself, which takes in three parameters. It takes in the raw moves as strings. It has a collected list of moves, which is kind of the output. And then it has a current turn to parse on, which is either x or 0. First off, if there are no more moves to apply, then we're done. We return the collected array. If there are moves to apply, we check. Is that first move a valid move format? Meaning, is it any prefix, turn, space, row, space, column, any post amount? If so, then yay, we found a valid move. We're going to have to parse it. In order to parse it, we collect parse raw moves. So we, we uh, pardon me, recursively call. We take the rest of the moves, so array.slice one, which we already saw, and what we pass it is first the originally collected moves and now this new extra one, and then we swap to the next turn. So once we find a raw move that matches the turn, space, row, space, column, with any uh, stuff around it format, we add it to our collected list and move on in the array. If the raw move does not match the format, such as in that first blank string we saw in the last slide, then we do a very similar approach. We still recurse. We still move on to the next set of raw moves, but we keep the collected as is. We don't add to it. We don't parse. And then we still go to next turn. Cool. This is fun. I like this. So this is, this is the whole thing that we did. Looks kind of bad. I mean, if, if, if you squint at it too long, it makes sense. But I'll admit, this is a lot of code. And honestly, a lot of the stuff just takes a little time to get used to. I think it's a little ridiculous in a good way. So I want to note, everything is complex until you get it. Until you have a real feeling for something, whether it's counting or TypeScript normally or TypeScript with type system shenanigans, it can feel overwhelming or ridiculous or useless at first. But if you just take a little while and let it absorb into you, it feels good. It's good stuff. It's fun. Anyway, now that we have this information, now that we have the ability to make this ridiculous type in the type system, what do we do with it? Well, to start, I definitely recommend this cute little type challenges repo. It's got a bunch of self-guided little challenges for you to take. Secondly, this, this presentation itself is definitely an open-ended book. Um, lastly, and most importantly, definitely type. DT is the public definition for high-quality TypeScript type definitions, meaning for packages that don't provide their own. It is currently Hacktoberfest. So if you're looking for a place to send the pull requests, highly recommend it. Anyway, thanks so much to the conference organizers and to you as an audience for sitting there at home listening to me. Uh, I'd love to hear what sort of fun stuff you do in the type system related to or not related to these topics. Uh, you can always tweet at me, and then I encourage you to check out the blog, which has more details on these types. Thanks.